call it a window on the universe, this 200-inch telescope atop Mount Palomar in Southern California. For on every clear night of the year, an astronomer in the observer's cage high up in the Silver Dome probes the limitless reaches of outer space. On sensitive photographic film, the big 200-inch eye has recorded the light of literally millions of stars, and the end is not yet. For centuries, philosophers and scientists have asked the question, where is the end? Where did it all come from? Of course, science does not know the answer to these questions, but we've learned enough through instruments like this to realize that our Earth is a mere grain of sand on the vast seashore of the starry universe. Out beyond the familiar constellations that dot our night sky, and beyond the distant star clouds and clusters of the Milky Way, which is the edge of our own galaxy, are other galaxies, island universes so far from us their light has taken millions of years, traveling at the speed of 670 million miles an hour to reach us. Within the range of our present telescopes are 100 million of these galaxies, each made up of billions of stars. These giant systems are rushing away from us at fantastic speeds. In fact, the more distant the galaxy, the faster it is moving. Many astronomers believe that all these galaxies are the same age and that they all started from the same place at the same time. As Lincoln Barnett, the gifted author of the bestseller, The Universe and Dr. Einstein writes, all the clues of science point to a time of creation when the cosmic fires were ignited and the vast pageant of the present universe was brought into being. The Bible says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The Bible never tries to prove the existence of God. It assumes it. The problem is, too often man tries to subject God to the analysis of the laboratory. But we cannot put God in a test tube and say, here is God any more than you can put a mother's love in a test tube and say this is a mother's love. Of course, the evidences of God are all about us. At Palomar, we probe the limitless reaches of the starry universe. And with the microscope, we can see a universe just as inscrutable, but so small that our most powerful instruments can only scratch the surface. To the naked eye, a drop of pond water often contains minute particles moving about. Under a microscope, the particles become living organisms, the world of the protozoa. It doesn't take long to reach the limits of the optical microscope. About a hundred diameters will do it. But then we must turn to the electron microscope. A beam of electrons similar to the one that gives you a picture on your television tube allows us to study objects two billionths of an inch in diameter, magnifying a specimen up to one million times. From the human body, a tiny bit of heart muscle, vital in the task of pumping man's blood supply. Rods and cones in the retina of the human eye. A few of the more than 100 million rods and 6 million cones that convey light images to the optic nerve another marvel of the human body's design and operation. What more eloquent evidence of the Creator's hand? No wonder many of our scientists say there must be a God. But there are other evidences of God's existence even stronger than the universe in which we live. For example, there's the conscience within every man, a warning light that flashes when we do wrong. Who put this voice within man to warn him of moral danger? Philosophers and even politicians discuss what is moral and what is not moral. Where did this sense of morality originate? We know it is wrong to murder, but how do we know it is wrong? It is the God-given voice of conscience within. Having accepted the fact of God, the next question we ask is, what kind of a person is he? We've already seen evidence that he's a God of order, design, and perfection. But when we pick up the Bible, we discover that God is much more. The Bible teaches that he is a God of righteousness and holiness. The Bible teaches that he is a God of judgment, that he is so pure that no impurity can stand in his presence. But more, the Bible teaches that God is love. 
And it is because God is love that he created the human race. Man was made for fellowship with his maker. The Bible tells us that when he became a living soul, he was placed in a paradise and given the privilege of ruling over it. And the Bible tells us that in the cool of the day, Adam walked with God in the paradise garden eastward of Eden. When God made man, he gave him the priceless gift of freedom, freedom of moral choice, a will of his own. He could obey or disobey God. He was not created a puppet or a machine. He had complete freedom of choice. And in the beginning, man chose to love and obey God. As a result, his life was a paradise. But one day, something happened. Man deliberately rebelled against God. He willfully broke God's moral law. And man's special relationship to God was broken. He began to suffer and die as the disease of sin entered the human race. He lost the peace, joy, and security that he had. The perfection of God's handiwork was stained. Eden became for man a paradise lost. Springing from the ground like a crystal clear spring, intended to be a river running through pleasant and productive pastures, man chose to take a course that plunged down from the sunny heights. Dashing against rocks and churning between deep sunless cliffs, all generations yet unborn plunged downward with Adam, infected by the disease of sin. And as God had warned Adam, the penalty of sin is suffering and death. The story of the river is the story of man since Adam. Though we lift our voices and cry for help, still we choose deliberately as Adam did the wrong way. As Winston Churchill once said, Man has improved himself every way except morally. We've resorted to every means to regain paradise. Our motives have been good, our attempts commendable. But the Bible says they've all fallen short. But God faced a dilemma. In spite of man's rebellion, God loved him. But being just, how could he forgive man unless the penalty for sin had been paid? This was the question that God faced. And with his love for man so strong, he immediately took the initiative to restore the broken fellowship, to provide a means for man's redemption. To the amazement of the whole universe, God decided to become a man in the person of his son. Shepherds in the fields keeping watch over their flocks were the first to hear the angelic announcement. I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. God had become flesh. God the Son coming to earth as a small babe on a bed of straw. He was the God-man. He was God, but he was also man. He labored with his hands as a carpenter's son facing temptations and trials common to all men. Yet he did not sin. When the time came to begin his public ministry, he stood in the synagogue and declared himself to be the one about whom the prophets wrote. I came down from heaven to do the will of him that sent me. I and my father are one, he said. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. To those who consider his words and study his life, one must conclude that either he was an egomaniac, or a deliberate liar and deceiver of the people, or he was who he claimed to be. In the Galilean countryside, the common people heard him gladly. He healed the sick, the lame, the halt, the blind. He quieted the storm on the sea and in many a troubled heart. What manner of man is this, they asked, that even the winds and the sea obey him? He not only healed, he raised the dead. At the tomb of Lazarus, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. It was in Jerusalem that his words cut deep into the hearts of the people. Jerusalem, 
capital of the religious world, but a city divided in its opinion. Some believed and some rejected. Man can never be neutral about the claims of Christ. He is the one who said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness. The true purpose of the coming of Jesus Christ was not just to heal and teach. His primary purpose was to redeem. He was born to die, to be a ransom for many. On a rugged hill, a cross stood bleak against the sky and became the pivotal point of history. What happened on that cross is a mystery. In some mysterious way, God took all of our sins and laid them on his son. God was saying from the cross to the whole human race, I love you. I will forgive you. On the morning of the third day after he was crucified, three women went to his tomb to anoint the body with spices. They were the first to hear the most dramatic announcement the human ear has ever heard. He is not here. He is risen. I am he that lives and was dead, Christ said. I am alive forevermore, and because I live, you shall live also. For the first time since sin entered the human race, there was hope for mankind. From the Mount of Olives above Jerusalem, Christ gave a command to the eyewitnesses of his resurrection. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, he said. What gospel? The word gospel means good news. Good news that God loves man, that sin has been atoned, that Christ is alive, that God will forgive sin, that God will give new life to all that believe. But those early followers of Christ as he stood on the mountain just before he ascended into heaven received another burning message. The Bible says that two messengers from heaven appeared and said to the disciples, This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. If the Bible teaches anything, it teaches that Jesus Christ is coming to earth again and that history is headed toward a dramatic climax. When Christ prayed that prayer, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, He knew that that prayer would ultimately be answered. He knew that God's kingdom would prevail someday. Yes, there is coming a worldwide peace, but not through the efforts of man alone, but by the authority and power of the Christ who ascended from this spot 2,000 years ago. The reality of Christ's resurrection power became the explosive dynamic that thrust the early believers out of Jerusalem and into the teeming Roman Empire. The trade routes that crossed the Great Sea became lines of communication for the good news of the gospel proclaimed by inspired men. None was more prolific than the Apostle Paul whose burning convictions drove him to the far corners of the Mediterranean world. Foundations for the space age of the 21st century were laid during the golden age of Greece, when the sciences of astronomy, mathematics, medicine, and many other tools of man's quest for knowledge were shaped. Little wonder that Paul's words in Athens during the first century are equally relevant to the mind of man today. Gentlemen of Athens, while it is true that God has overlooked the days of man's spiritual ignorance, he now commands all men everywhere to repent, 
For he has fixed the day on which he will judge the whole world in justice by the standard of a man whom he has appointed. That this is so, he has guaranteed to all men by raising this man from the dead. Down through the centuries, whenever men and women of any culture have honestly approached the mystery of the cross, they have encountered the spirit of the living Christ. The message of forgiveness, comfort, and hope has transformed men in every generation. Augustine was born in North Africa and reared in the fourth century paganism of the Roman Empire. At the age of 30, he went to Rome, a witty, willful, sensual skeptic. The story of Augustine is the story of human nature. I sought a way of obtaining strength sufficient to enjoy God and found it not until I embraced that mediator betwixt God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Pascal, French physicist and mathematician, set the 17th century on fire with his personal convictions about Jesus Christ. Not only do we know God by Jesus Christ alone, but we know ourselves only by Jesus Christ. Apart from him, we do not know what is our life, nor our death, nor ourselves. War and Peace brought the Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy permanent fame as a literary artist. Shortly before completing Anna Karenina, he entered a period of profound searching as to the purpose of life, a search that led him to Christ. When I came to believe in Christ's teaching, I ceased desiring what I had wished for before. The direction of my life, my desires became different. What was good and bad changed places. The early days of America reflect the faith of our nation's founding fathers. Their courage and high purpose stemmed from a strong awareness of man's spiritual need. We all remember the scene of George Washington on his knees in prayer at Valley Forge. The letter Benjamin Franklin wrote to the Speaker of the Senate asking that the Constitutional Congress begin each day with prayer. These were days when this country was being born. Certainly not all of our forefathers were true believers. There were many dark spots in America's early years. For example, slavery. But the driving force behind our Constitution, the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence, was faith in God. Our forefathers stamped this faith on our coins. They put Bibles in our courtrooms. They opened the Congress with prayer. They instituted the custom of our president taking the oath of office on the Bible. It was this faith and this book which largely gave birth to our concept of freedom. During those last brief months of his presidency, Lincoln spoke of the Bible. All the good the Savior gave to the world was communicated through this book. But for it, we could not know right from wrong. All things most desirable for man's welfare are to be found portrayed in it. The world will never understand the greatness and genius of America without understanding the religious faith and convictions of our fathers. There are those who say this faith was all right in the first century, but what about this scientific age in which we live today? Is the Bible still relevant and trustworthy? Can the gospel transform modern man? On the campus of George Washington University in the nation's capital, the Dean of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Calvin D. Linton, shares a personal conviction. I'm afraid that our neat little predictable world is vanishing and that man is becoming more and more a lonely creature in the universe, doubting his mastery even of his own environment. Our fear of physical death has been transcended by a greater fear, that of total meaninglessness. I believe man must descend the stairs of his self-conceit and learn to be still. Only then can he hear the words of the one by whom the worlds were made, the one who declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Only the heart that puts its trust in this Jesus of history and of eternity 
can face today's world and today's universe without fear. And what of the world of industry? Are the claims of Jesus Christ relevant in the fiercely competitive marketplace of commercial enterprise? Dr. Elmer Engstrom, president of RCA, has an answer. This model of our weather satellite is a constant reminder to me that man's advances through science continue on an accelerated scale. With the understanding we're developing through science, can we, within this understanding, conceive of how a supreme being could dip his hands into the affairs of men and of the world to influence and to control what takes place? To this, I give a definite answer of yes. I believe that one who is committed to Jesus Christ as his or her Lord and Master has an assurance and a satisfaction in ongoing affairs that is not known by those who are not Christ's followers. With Christ as my master and as the Lord of history, living for me is a glorious experience and adventure in his service. The senior staff psychiatrist of Harvard University, Dr. Armand M. Nikolai, Jr. We live in an age of explosive increase of knowledge, yet for the mass of men in this century, the most basic questions remain unanswered. How does one find direction and purpose in his life? Secondly, how does one face the reality of his own death? Today, many are turning to psychiatry for answers to these questions, and in doing so, are making impossible demands on it. Modern dynamic psychiatry is primarily concerned with deepening man's understanding of the functioning of the mind and in freeing him from the tyranny of mental illness. It has made great progress in this area. Psychiatry is not, however, primarily interested in purpose and destiny. It is here that the Christian gospel becomes intensely relevant. Christianity is concerned precisely with these questions. Thus today, the claims of Christ demand careful and critical assessment. He brings to each life committed to him direction, purpose, and an understanding of who we are and why we are here. And when we face alone, as each of us must, the prospect of death, Christ's death and resurrection become profoundly meaningful. He replaces fear, bitterness, and despair with hope, with faith, and with unspeakable comfort. Like a temple in ruins, its beauty destroyed by the ravages of nature, man waits and yearns for his paradise lost to be regained. Something inside the human heart has never forgotten its native place. Here at the New York World's Fair, you are seeing some of the fantastic progress of science. Yes, man's achievements in the expanding universe have been tremendous, but they've never really met our deepest needs. Here on this screen, you have seen that you were created in the image of God. But with the rest of the human race, you too rebelled against his moral law. The Bible says that God is too pure even to look upon iniquity. Therefore, your sin separates you from God. This moral deterioration in your soul has caused frustration, confusion, doubt, and trouble. But in spite of your failure, in spite of your sin and rebellion, God loved you so much that he gave his son to die for you on the cross. God wants to forgive the past, but more than that, he wants to give you a new peace, a new joy, and a new strength to meet the problems of life and a new capacity to love your neighbor. In other words, he wants to make you a completely new person. This is what he meant when he said, you must be born again. As you were born of the flesh the first time, so you must be born of the spirit. On every continent of the world, I've seen God change lives. Men and women who were morally bankrupt, people with cares and burdens too heavy to bear, have been made alive and radiant by the power of the resurrected Christ. I've proclaimed this message to people of all races, cultures, and nationalities. 
And I've seen them respond to the invitation to receive Jesus Christ. I've seen these people go to church to learn and grow in Christian discipleship. I've seen men become involved in the society in which they live with a new purpose and a whole new dimension of life. This could happen to you. How could it happen to you? Jesus said, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. You must come to Christ with the trust and simplicity of a child. First, you must be willing to repent of sin. Repentance means that you change your mind about God and your relationship to Him. Repentance involves also a willingness to change your whole pattern of living. Notice I said a willingness. You may not have the strength or the ability to repent, but if you're willing, God will help you to repent. Secondly, you must turn to Christ by simple faith and accept Him as your Lord and Savior. Notice again, I said, by faith. If you wait until you can understand it all, you will never come. It must be a step of faith. It's like receiving a gift, the gift of pardon for the past and a new life for the future. Many of you have come with an emptiness and a restlessness in your heart and soul. Intellectually, some of you are not certain about the purpose and meaning of life. You've never really committed yourself to any great cause or purpose. You long to have something to believe in, a flag to follow and a song to sing. Why not commit your life to Jesus Christ and let his love and authority dominate your life? Others of you have been suffering from a sense of guilt. You would like to wake up tomorrow morning with a sense of forgiveness, to know that all the failure and sin of the past is completely gone, to have an exhilaration that only God can give to a person. This tremendous change in your life could take place right here and now. A commitment to Christ is only the first step, but it's a necessary step if you are to enter the kingdom of God. You could make this commitment at this moment. I'm asking you to do it now. Respond to that inner voice of the Holy Spirit that is saying you need God. This is your moment, your moment of decision the most important decision of your life. Let this be the beginning of your new life in the fifth dimension, the dimension of the Spirit.